All right, it's time for a new series on customizing normals and shading in Blender. I've spent the last few months exploring options for getting clean, stylized tune shading, and I found that we have a lot, and in this series I'm going to tell you all about them. We'll be working with data transfer, geometry nodes, UVs, shader nodes, and textures. This series is specifically about normals and stylized shading, but we'll be learning a huge amount of general knowledge. I want this to be accessible to people without a lot of existing node experience, so I'll be building up from the basics on most topics. I recommend watching even if you aren't working on tune style specifically. In this intro video, we'll be taking a look at some of the problems we want to solve and previewing various tools and setups we'll be learning about. Then the second part, we'll get into some of the fundamentals of how vertex normals work and why we have these problems in the first place. To start things off at the very beginning, check out this plane. It's bent, it's got even topology, and if we render it with a tune shader, it's nice and clean. And if we subsurf it, it's still nice and clean. Now here's a copy of the plane that I have knifed a bunch of bad topology into, and it's no surprise that when we render it, the shading looks terrible. And it looks terrible in all sorts of different ways in different places. And if we subsurf it, it doesn't really get better. It gets a little cleaner, smoother maybe, but the shapes are still really bad and wrong, and no amount of subsurf is ever going to fix it. Now, of course, it's no secret that bad topology gives bad shading, but have you ever really wondered why it does? And maybe not just why does it give bad shading, but like why this specifically? Why is this jagged bit going this way instead of, say, going that way? Like, what are the rules? What? weird thing gives you what results. Have you ever really seen that explained? And probably not, because it's not really the question we ask. The real question is, how do we fix it? Of course, the solution is usually straightforward. If your topology is bad, then just retopologize it and make it good, then the problem goes away, right? Well, sometimes you have bad topology for really good reasons, like complex rigging, or complex shapes that can't easily be reduced to a quad grid. Or maybe your topology was good, and now it's bad because of deformations from a rig, like at the back of a character's knee or something. And also, retopology is just a lot of work, so if there's anything easier we can do, we definitely like that. And we do have another option. Data transfer. We're going to transfer the normals from this plane to this plane. And our shading is fixed. Super easy. But is this going to work on more complex models? Here is my trusty pseudo anime face, and we can render that, and we can see that the shading shapes are not great. It's really wiggly, and even if we turn on subsurf, they don't really improve much. The broad shapes are kind of right, like if this just went down like that, and like the nose isn't too bad, but this isn't really how you'd want to draw this. There's too many bits and pieces, and part of that is because the topology is fairly dense. Now, this topology has all sorts of issues and could definitely be better for shading. I've got triangles, I've got like this stretch quad, I've got poles, I've got weird loop flow and uneven spacing and whatever the hell this is. It could definitely be better. But I don't want to change it because it's the way it is for a good reason, which is this face rig. This rig is a bendy bone based squash and stretch rig. It's quite powerful, but it needs a high level of topology. As you can see, the bone chains line up with the loop flow, which is part of the reason I can't easily retopologize to different loops without giving up the level of control I have. And even if I wasn't using a rig like this, the general principle is that the more detail you want to be able to get out of any sort of rig, the more topology you're going to need. And the topology you need for that generally won't be the same topology that is going to give you good shading. So let's try the normal transfer from a clean topology on this face. We'll leave the original on the left for comparison. And it's nice and clean. But it's also eliminated all of the details. In fact, it's clean because we got rid of details, but we also lost details we want, like the nose is gone. So we'll need to add those back in, but we can do that. It doesn't work as nicely with subsurf disabled, of course, because now this is lower poly. But I do need to do that in order to use the rig. And you can see the transfer mesh is also rigged, so we continue to get a nice transfer even when deforming the face. And this is quite important because we can see 
as we move the face around, this deformation has a large effect on the original, but it's not changing things so much on the transferred version, and that's because this continues to remove detail. We can see, for example, if I move this over to the eye, that this is making quite a large difference. I'm changing the eye shape, and it's staying fairly smooth across it, whereas on the original, it's changing the shading shapes quite a bit, like this whole area is flowing in and out of shape, which isn't really ideal. It's not really how this would be drawn. This isn't perfect, but it is a lot better. So we have now answered our earlier question. We can improve shading even on complex rig topology using this normal transfer method, as long as we have everything set up for it. And that is what this video series is going to be about. We'll be starting with the basics, like how to get the most out of the data transfer modifier and handle problems it can have. Then we'll move into geometry nodes, which lets us have more power and options. And then we'll end up in shader nodes to learn about normal and bump mapping, how to bake the stuff we made in other methods down into textures, and all sorts of things. Okay, so what is actually going to be in this video series? Before I just show you a big list of topics, let's go back in time to my previous video, which was about these object space generated face normals. This setup was my first try at solving these various shading issues, and it works quite well because you just replace the mesh with math, essentially, math based on the mesh's position, and that's a great solution if you just want a simple clean shape on any mesh, and if you don't need to worry about details. And actually, someone's even got this working in Unity and has an article on how to do that. So I'll put that in the description because some people were asking about that. But of course, the problem with this setup overall is that we don't have any details. If we want like a nose or lips or like eye ridge stuff, we're going to need to add that back in, which was originally what the next video was going to be about. I had made a nose in the previous video, but it wasn't very good and it was really hard to set up. So my real plan for details was to just bump map them on, which I tested in an earlier version, and it was fine. So I made a height map, and got a bump node, and we'll plug the bump node in, and it's crap. It's all noisy, and whatever this is, and you can see bits of the mesh geometry lines, like, what? And this took me totally by surprise, because it had been working. So I needed a new idea. So I thought, okay, bump maps are kind of old and weird. So instead, I will go and I'll get a normal map node, because normal mapping is like the new thing you use. And I'll make a normal map, and then I'll plug my... Oh, yeah, there's no way to plug the generated normals in. The color is where the normal map goes, so what do I do? The normal map, it turns out, is actually just hardwired to the default mesh. Unlike the bump map node, you cannot just put in any arbitrary normals you want. So I thought, okay, this normal map node doesn't give me the options I want, but maybe I can build a node group that does give me those options. And maybe I can build a node group that does bump mapping without the problems it has, because I'm pretty sure I haven't had those in the past, right? There's got to be something I'm not understanding. And I didn't know it at the time, but trying to figure out those things was actually embarking on a multi-month project. I'll spare you all the gory details, but as some of you who are following me on Twitter know, I've had a giant whip thread up since the end of September that chronicles a lot of this and all the different things I've been experimenting with, all the way through shader nodes and into newer geometry node stuff, and all the way up to the beginning of the production of this series, haha. -ha. So my first goal was to recreate the bump map node. So I started Googling around for how bump mapping works, which is frustrating because when you do that, what you get is a bunch of coding articles from like 2006 through 2012 about bump mapping, but they're actually all about normal mapping. Basically, they say that they're about bump mapping, and then you read them and they say, well, bump mapping is old and normal mapping is the new thing, so here's how you actually do normal mapping. Or they'll have a bunch of code in there, but not tell you how any of it works. And I didn't know how to read GLSL code, so that wasn't very helpful. So I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to be looking at code, why not just go straight to EV source code for the bump map node, which is this. And I figured, well, maybe I can piece together the math and build out of math nodes. And that was wrong. 
But luckily, I also thought to look at what the Cycles bump node is for the OSL shaders, because OSL and GLSL are very similar. And it's the same code, slightly differently, but it's the same thing. And this has a citation to where it came from. So I went and found this paper. Here it is. And this did not make anything easier. Uh, I did not do advanced math in college. I don't even know what to Google to read these. But it does have code snippets. I did some more research. And I found that there's a later paper with even more about bump mapping by the same guy. And it's worse. And by that I mean there's even less here that I can understand. But from reading it and doing further research, I was very, very slowly starting to piece things together. And I realized that the problem I was having is that these articles are written for people who already know how these things work. And it, these are updates on how to do bump mapping better, basically. And that the various GLSL blogs I've been reading were basically also written for people who kind of know how things work and also know how GLSL works. And what was missing was really a visual description. And of course, like most 3D artists, I'm extremely visual in how I understand things. If I am to understand math like this, it will be by having a mental picture of what this means. So I realized that if I was ever going to get anywhere with this, I needed to be able to look at it. So I was going to need to learn to read GLSL code at least a little bit. And I started doing that, and I decided to work on the normal map node first because it was a bit simpler. And after a bunch of reading stuff and bothering people, I did actually get it working. Here's a custom normal map node made out of existing nodes. It can take any normals as an input. You can normal map on top of the generated normals or on top of baked normals, or you can normal map on top of other normal maps, whatever you want. The catch is that you need to feed it a tangent that's appropriate, and that's a complicated subject, but we'll be covering that later. Here's what it looks like inside. It's not even that complicated in the end. And like half of these nodes are just like, you know, fixing back faces and the strength and stuff. So normal mapping wasn't too bad in the end. So emboldened by that success, I went back to the bump mapping, which is much more complicated. But to solve this, I used Malt, Blender's new render engine, which lets you input any old arbitrary GLSL code. And what I did was I just rebuilt this one line at a time and I just looked at what it was actually doing on my model, and then I could tell what this did. So I understood the code by looking at what the code did visually, and then once I understood the code enough, I was actually able to go back and read these research papers a little bit, like 25%, which then made me realize a ton of other things and put together all these connections and then learn a bunch of other stuff about normals in general. And then once I'd figured all that out, and I really knew how it worked, I was actually able to read articles that previously I'd read and didn't understand. And I also knew the right keywords to search for to find articles that, if I'd found them before, would have, well, bypassed a lot of this whole project. And of course, in the end, I did make the custom bump map node. And it's beautiful. Aha. It's not covered in random garbage. So unlike the normal mapping node, the bump map node is pretty complicated. And this is because I had to work around a lot of things that Eevee doesn't just let me do. Bump mapping uses a bunch of JLSL commands that there is no node for in Eevee. So it's kind of a mess. Like the setup works. It's pretty weird, though. Like you have to have three copies of your texture. So you actually have to run your texture inside a node group and then have three copies of that node group and feed them different uh, UVs. So it works, but it gets pretty funky and it's dense. So I do want to do a video about this at some point. Maybe it'll be like the last video in this series. I might kick it down the road to a later one because I'm not sure anyone will actually want to use this. The stuff I figured out since in geometry nodes just means that you can do a workflow where you, you use geometry nodes and you use normal mapping and you can bypass bump mapping. But I did figure out the reasons that it has those problems. So maybe you'll want them for some other thing that isn't necessarily like anime face shading, but some other situation where you do need bump mapping and those problems get in your way.
So it's kind of a shame that we may not end up using the custom bump map because I put so much work into it, but it hasn't been a waste at all because I learned so much working on it. And that information is a lot of what's going to be in this series. Part of what I've been learning is that there's a lot of technical knowledge that's out there among coders and mathematicians, but that doesn't seem to show up enough in spaces where artists can find it. For example, surface gradients. They're the answer to a fairly common question, which is how do I combine multiple normal maps together? I've seen that being asked on like forums and stack exchange and stuff in the context of Blender for years, and normally the answer is that you can't, or at least not without problems. But surface gradients are in that paper from 2010, and they are probably in other stuff before that. So the solution's always been there, it just wasn't somewhere that I could find it, or lots of other people apparently. Another example is this tangent space difference node I've made. If you've ever wondered what actually happens when you're baking a normal map, well, this is what's happening. It takes two normals and it gets the difference between them in tangent space. And we won't get into what a tangent means here, but basically this lets you take any normals you want. They can be custom normals, they can be generated, they can be something you pass out of geometry nodes, whatever and you can actually output them as the sort of tangent map you're used to that then can be used with well, my custom normal map node. If they're in the right format, you can even use them with the base normal map node, which is the color input. So this is really useful if we're going to say, make a bunch of custom normals and you know maybe have edited normals on the mesh and then have some decals and then have some stuff from geometry nodes and we wanna put it all together into one map, you're gonna need this kind of thing. So if we go back to my Twitter thread and the timeline we can see from it, I'd actually figured out most of this stuff by like November, or early December, but I realized I had a new problem, which is that I had all these tools for how to make things into normals and mix normals together and apply them and all that, but you still need to define the actual shape somehow. And doing that procedurally in shaders is possible, but it's just a terrible workflow. It's a terrible artistic workflow. and a lot of that stuff, like how do you how do you get a gradient of this nose? Like even just how do you make this bump map procedurally and have it really be clean and proper? It's just miserable. I won't go through all of my experience of that. I have a graveyard of nodes that we could look at for that, but we're just not going to get into that stuff because there's a better way, which is geometry nodes. I didn't know that originally. Uh, you know, geometry nodes have been around for a while, but they got a big update recently, and I hadn't really gotten into them because, you know, they were still new. So I started looking at normal transfer stuff in general, and I realized that there was kind of a path to an actual workflow that would work for artists. And then I realized that all of that normal st uh, transfer stuff could be done better in geometry nodes after a certain point, and I switched to that, which is why that's what we're going to start with for this series because the advantage to working in geometry nodes is it's all the same math conceptually, but you can see what you're doing the whole time because it's there. We're actually just going to model the geometry for the shapes we want and then get the normals from it and then use this normal combining math on that. And it's just so much easier. We can start at the ground up. You don't have to have any of this knowledge or deal with any of this crazy fancy node stuff. So we're going to spend the first half of the series doing that and building into it. And then by the time we get to using these shader nodes, you're going to find that you actually already understand most of this stuff. And it's just, it's going to work way better. Let's take a closer look at the geometry nodes normal transfer setup. We start with a plane. This plane is then wrapped onto the face, which creates the transfer object and then normals are transferred from the object to the final head. The setup doesn't have to be spread across multiple objects like this, but I've done it this way because it gives us a lot of flexibility. We can dip in at any point in this pipeline and edit things. For example, we can subdivide the base input plane. The more subdivisions, the more detail of the input face it picks up. In this case, it's too much. We can also make changes on the input mesh, like here's some shape keys I've sculpted. As we change the input mesh, it changes the transfer object, which is wrapped to it, and we can see the change in the final normal shape on the actual head, even though its mesh is unchanged. This means that we can go on to here and kind of sculpt the shape we want, which may be 
really weird looking in the end, but what matters is the shading. And the amount of detail that this picks up is limited by its vertex count like we saw before. So our sculpting doesn't even have to be all that clean. This gives us a lot of artistic control. And of course, we can make changes on the transfer mesh itself, like subdividing it after it's been wrapped around the target, which smooths things out and increases our detail resolution. Or we can hit it with a smooth modifier, which will also smooth things in different ways. Or we can run a lattice on it and do all sorts of stuff with that. And we can see the changes it makes to our shading in real time. And this particular input mesh isn't even the only option. The nodes themselves actually let you just use a grid, and we can just adjust that grid's resolution. Now the higher resolution picks up more detail from the original model, as said. But we can also use the setup to, say, have multiple different transfer meshes of different detail levels, and then mix between what normals get applied on what area of the main face. So we could make a very high detail mesh to pick up some of the eye socket detail, and then have a low detail one for the cheek to keep that clean and simple. All right, but what about details? Like, we still need to get our nose and all that stuff back. Well, we have lots of options for that, too. Here is a flat unwrap of the face. We can make changes to it, like bumping that out, which is, this is just a rough example. And the changes we make to this mesh are reflected in the normals of the main head as if they were displaced, but you can see the geometry hasn't actually changed. And they're being applied to the custom normals that were already transferring from the previous transfer mesh. Let's see, it's got a nose there too. That previous example was topology to topology changes, but that's not the only option. Here, I've just modeled the nose I want, and it doesn't match the topology at all. It has the right topology to get decent shading, and it's just being projected to the nearest vertices. Now, this is a bit low quality when the subsurf isn't on, but if I turn that on, then we can see it looks a lot better. It's still a bit rough around the edges, though, so we need more subsurf or to bake it to a normal map or something. Or we can get even crazier. This time, to solve the problem, I've taken the same nose mesh and it's projected onto the face mesh, like shrink wrapped on. Well, it's not shrink wrap, it's similar. So, you know, you can't have the wrong topology if you just project the clean topology. But it is pretty bad performance wise, but that also doesn't really matter because in the end, we're just going to bake this to a normal map of some sort. Then we'll have good quality and good performance. Here's what that normal map actually looks like. And we can see that even with no subsurf on the model, the quality is great, like, like really great, although it is a high res texture. Uh, look how clean that is. So there is a secret element that ties this whole setup together, makes it easier to work with, keeps the transfers clean, and that is that it is UV map based. This is the UV map of the face. I mean, literally, if we go into UV mode, it's the UV map of the face. It is a copy of the face where the mesh has been set to have its vertices match its UV map's position. If you've done normal transfer before with the data transfer modifier, then you know it can be tricky to get a clean transfer on anything other than topology. If the meshes are different, then it's doing a proximity transfer, and unless your meshes line up very cleanly, you start having issues. So the solution is to make sure they always line up super cleanly by unwrapping them to UV space. Like here, we can unwrap the head to be flat, and we can unwrap the transfer mesh to be flat. And if joined together, we can see that those are perfectly overlaying each other. So we're always going to have a very reliable proximity transfer, no matter what deformations those objects actually do. The normals get transferred from the original shape mesh to a flat version of that mesh, then from the flat transfer mesh to the real face, the flat version of the real face, and we can actually look at them in that state. The mesh is flat, but there's our shading because it has normals on it. Then it comes through and it gets input from flattened versions of the details that have gone through the same process, like there's that nose. And then in the end, after everything is put together, 
we output it all back to the original mesh. Another strength of this setup is it makes it very easy to bake things. We can bypass the normal bake system entirely because we already have everything laid out to match our texture. So I've got an orthographic camera aimed at my reference grid, and it matches the bounds. So whatever we put here when we render it, that just is our texture. So here's some nodes that get us the normals we need. This is an object space normal map. Or, since I have the node group to convert things to a tangent map, there's our normal map of the nose. And that's just the nose geometry with a lot of subsurf, so it's nice and clean, and you just stick it over there, and you snap a picture of it, and it's perfectly lined up in UV space. Super simple. So that's the geometry node setup that we're going to be learning about. There's a lot in it and a lot of features, and you don't necessarily need all of this. So don't feel compelled to build the whole setup. My goal will be to teach you enough that you can build what you need for your specific character and project or whatever. We'll be starting at the beginning, and you'll be able to get a lot out of even basic setups. So don't worry if this looks a bit intimidating right now. Okay, that was a lot of previewing. So here's a nice big summary list of what we're going to be trying to learn. Also, please note that this series is not going to get into regular vertex normal editing or Guilty Gear style topology workflows. Some of what I'll be talking about will help with those, and other things might be good alternatives. But the series will already be very long, and those topics are well covered elsewhere already. Here is a more specific list of the tools and concepts we're going to be covering, and it'll be in roughly this order. Also, a note on how the content is going to be structured. Each video will start with a clear outline of what's in it. This is because I know we're going to have people of different skill levels, and sometimes the bulk of a video will be a step-by-step -step explanation that experienced noters aren't going to need. So these will be put at the end or as their own video, and that will be clearly denoted. Okay, we've been looking at ways that we're going to learn to solve problems with normals. But now in part two, let's take a look at why we have these problems in the first place. It all has to do with how vertex normals are calculated and how they are interpolated to make the smooth shading that we're used to working with. We're back to our planes that we started with, but we've got a new material that will make it easier to observe what exactly is going on. We've got a tune shader that's made out of running a diffuse shader through a greater than, so this tune shader is simply lit or unlit, it's as basic as it can get. And for that to work properly, your world has to have no light strength being used. In this case, I've got a light path so that I can still adjust the background color without that light necessarily influencing the shader. We're also looking at the normals themselves, but with some modification. Normals on their own are pretty hard to see anything useful in, because half of the range is negative and it's just color gradients. So like in my previous video, we're going to step them, but this time we're using the new vector option on the map range node. But there's a ton of input, so I'm hiding that. And then to make it easier to see, we're putting them through an absolute. So the negative values also appear positive. And we've got a wireframe setup as well, but we don't need that quite yet. All right, so this bad topology, we were looking at this earlier and it's a good example of really dirty topology, but normally topology isn't this dirty. So, you know, just because this is having problems doesn't mean that we're going to have problems on a regular model, right? Well, let's look at a much cleaner example. Here's the plane, and we're just going to hit it with a bevel modifier. So it's still a quad grid, just with uneven sizing. And even just that totally massacres our shading, even if we subsurf it. Like if we look at this from the side, Visually, we can hardly even tell that that isn't a clean curve, but this is how sensitive tune shading is to just any amount of issues with topology. And it's important to note that a lot of this problem is because we're using tune shaders and they just show everything so much worse. Like if we look at a soft shader like you'd use in normal PBR shading like in a game, it's nowhere near as bad. Like we can still see it, but imagine this is a more complex shape, and then you also are adding surface details with normal or bump maps or something, or maybe you have some normal maps from a higher res model to clean this up, and you won't notice these issues between everything else going on. But now that I've shown you this problem, if you look for it, you will find it pretty much everywhere.
Okay, back to our really bad topology because that makes it easier to see. So at the very beginning of this video, we asked the question of why is the shading bad specifically in the way that it's bad? Why is it dragging here? Why doesn't like the shading go from here to here? You know, there's an edge here, there's an edge here, that makes sense. Why does it go like that instead of from here to here or dragging in some other way? And the answer is that actually there is a face there. If we look at our wireframe, we can see we have all these triangles. And that is because all meshes are converted to only triangles in the render engine. The graphics card only operates on triangles. So while we work in quads for visual simplicity, it's all triangles. And where it forms the triangles can give us these really weird results. So since the problem is these bad triangles, we can actually get some improvements if we triangulate ourselves in a better way. I don't know exactly what the logic is for how the graphics card triangulates, but if we use the triangulate modifier, we have these nicer beauty options, which are a bit more sensitive to creating uh, triangles with consistent surface area, and that is definitely an improvement. But it's not really a solution overall, because it doesn't play that well with subsurf. We look at our subdivisions here, we look at it um, with the triangulate after, it's actually making things more jagged. And if we put the triangulate before, then it's just complete chaos. So if you're not using subsurf, you can get some mileage out triangulate, but it's not really a solution. So as we said at the start, the best solution is data transferring normals from a clean mesh. So the one on the left is transferring to the right. And if you're curious how that's working, they're not on top of each other, but since their origin points are in the same place, the data transfer modifier has this little option. And if it's on, which I think is the default, then it's calculating in world space. But if it's off, it's doing it in object space. So as far as it's concerned, these actually are superimposed. And the reason this works is because we're using nearest face interpolated. So what does this interpolated mean? And why exactly is this fixing things? We've looked at what, how it's breaking sort of visually. We know it has to do with these triangles and where the shading crosses the edges, but why is that doing that? To understand that, we need to go to our next example. So here we have a cube that has had the sides removed and it's been rotated a bit. We can see we've got some colors which are telling us something about the normal direction and the shading is only on the back because it's so simple that there's no shading to capture on the front. Blue indicates that it is pointing on the Z axis, and since we're in absolute, it just means it has Z up or down, and green is the Y axis. This is easier to see if we look at them individually. There's nothing to see on X because there's no faces on the X axis, and there's no curvature here. And there's the Y. White means pointing on Y, black means not pointing on Y, and we can see that we have a gradient from pointing on Y to not. And same thing for Z, but in the vertical direction. And this is a little confusing if you think about it, because these gradients indicate a change of normal direction, but of course this is a totally planar mesh. If we look at it on flat, then, well, there's almost nothing to see, because each face only points in one direction. But we're seeing this stuff because we're using smooth shading, and smooth shading is simulating curvature. And the root of our problems is how it simulates curvature. Let's tap into edit mode and enable normal display. First of all, here's the face normals, which are a bit hard to see, but there they are. This is telling us what direction the face is pointing in, and that corresponds to the flat shading, also known as the true normal. And here are the vertex normals. This is telling us what direction these vertices are pointing in. And that's a bit more confusing because, well, a vertex is just a point, so how does it have a direction at all? but the vertex normals are what is used for smooth shading. So we know that a face normal, what this line is showing us, is the angle perpendicular to the face. The face you know, runs this way, the normal runs that way. So what exactly is the vertex normal indicating? Well, if we look from the side, we can see that it is the average of the two faces connected to it. And if we select one of those faces and rotate it, it remains always the average of the faces that compose it. In fact, it's the average of all of the faces that compose it, but in this case, there's just two here. When we render with smooth shading, the values we're looking at in the shader here is an interpolation across each face between the vertices that make up that face. 
So if we look at our y's again, this vertex normal is pointing down the y-axis, and these vertex normals are not pointing on y at all. So the value across the face is a linear mix from white to black. And you know, halfway down the face, it's 0.5, three quarters, it's 0.25, etc. So the reason we start having our shading problems with more complicated topology is that this is all there is to smooth shading. It's literally just a linear interpolation between the vertex normals. And that doesn't always make sense visually. Let's get a visual illustration of what's going on. Here is a copy of the same shape, and we're going to add a loop. And something changed immediately. It's difficult to say what. And if we move this loop with edge slide, we can really see what's changing. So before, this was being interpolated from 90 to 0 across the whole face, and now it's being interpolated from 90 to 45 in this space, and from 45 to 0 in that space. So it's completely changed the simulated curvature. And again, this seems weird because we're looking at a planar shape, so we're thinking it's planar, but remember we're simulating curvature. To better visualize what we're doing, let's turn on subsurf on both meshes. The original turns into a cylinder, whereas the one with an extra loop, it's holding its original shape better, because subsurf is doing the same thing with its smoothing. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's the same concept, where the more loops we have, the more it's holding the shape it had, because it's only smoothing across areas where there is a bend. So these flat areas don't change. It's only going to change across here to here. So the same principle is at work with smooth shading and normals. We can also see this in action if we take a look from the front and move our light. As we rotate it, we can see that the speed that the terminator moves across this surface is basically steady because it's a linear curve. It's curving the same amount. Whereas on the right, it moves a bit on the curvature then it hits the flat spot and suddenly snaps to it, and then stays about there until it reaches the top. Now, if we do the exact same thing with subsurf disabled, it's the same effect, because we're simulating curvature with smooth normals. So all of that is actually working fairly well. We don't have any problems in these examples. The simulated curvature is working properly. But things start getting complicated once we have another face involved. Here is a full cube, and now it has x. Before we didn't have that. So now the values of this vertices normals are going to be, well, that. But actually, our simulated curvature will work just fine on this cube, too. You can actually see how evenly the curves of the normals are spaced. There's not really an issue there. And that's because it still has even topology. The faces are the same size. So next, we're going to look at a situation where things are really funky. So this wacky mesh has a bunch of stuff going on. And if we move the light, we can see that we've got what we had on our original bad mesh, where we have these sharp corners on our shading. Like the shading we'd actually like to have would be, you know, if you took each of these points and had that be a curve point on like a Bezier curve, you know, running through here smoothly. That's what we'd like to be happening. And if we subsurf it enough, well, the shape just changes so much that it's not really, we can't really compare it. If we do a simple subsurf where it doesn't add curvature, it also is changing it a lot, but it's still pretty sharp. So that doesn't really do us any good. So if we turn back on our triangles, and I'm going to turn off the normal stepping so we can see the gradient, we can finally see what exactly is causing this problem of the jagged bend. Why is it going to the edge formed by the triangle and then making this shape? So the value of the normal halfway down this edge will be an even mix of the two vertices that make up the edge. And similarly, for this edge, it'll be these two. The value in the center will be an even mix of all three vertices. But what's the value in the center of the quad here? Well, it's just these two. It's 50% of these. Because this triangle does not know that this triangle exists. So there's no contribution from this vertex onto this triangle. 
So the problem we're looking at here is similar to our earlier example where we had a planar face and then a planar face with loops, but that actually makes a big deal to the curvature because it's only calculating the curvature where there's a difference in face angle. And we're seeing a similar thing here on the same face when it's triangulated. And basically the easy way to understand this visually is that since this triangle has uneven side lengths, this edge is longer, it's going to cause this change in direction of the normals and the shading because it's a linear mix over a longer edge than on the other two sides. So if we go back to our really bad topology now, we can definitely see this effect in play. Like this zigzagging is almost being caused by like these triangle edge lengths pulling it in different directions. And you get to some of these really long ones and you just get this big extreme effect. And like, it's not as simple as like the shading is going to go halfway down one edge and then halfway down the next. It's similar to that, but since there's three axes at play and this is actually, there's a lot going on, it's not quite that simple. But the basic issue of it's going to be pulled in different directions, especially by small faces like this with a long edge, that's easy to understand and plan for when you're modeling. And now we can also see why triangulate on beauty helps so much. It triangulates in a way that avoids those really long edges. You still have problems, but you have way less just because things are more consistent. So to recap, the reason we get messy shading is because smooth shading is faking curvature by interpolating vertex normals across the faces. So if your faces aren't even, then the interpolation won't really be even and you'll have a variety of problems. And the reason that transferring normals from a clean match fixes it is because these are then interpolating the vertex normals first. So for example, we have this vertex here, which doesn't exist in this mesh, but it's getting given the value as if it were in this position on this mesh. And then that value is interpolated on this face, which gives you the same result. So it just removes all these problems, even when you're going from a lower poly to a higher poly shape, because you're just overriding with a clean source. So when we're seeing nearest face interpolated for the data transfer mode, what that's referring to is that the value for a vertex is the value interpolated for the face transferring to it. It's different from the vertex normal interpolation. So there's multiple interpolations going on, so don't get confused by that. Jumping back over here for a moment, I should clarify that there are ways to deal with this problem. So the vertex normal is the average of the face normals, right? So if we split that edge so that these vertices are actually separate, then when there's no face at the edge, then they get no contribution from it. So right now, these vertex normals are just completely equal to those face normals. And that is actually what's done when you use auto smooth or when you mark an edge sharp. It's going to automatically split that edge in the GPU to make these faces planar and avoid this whole issue. This also explains why on our original plane, even though our shading is nice and clean, we have this change in direction towards the edge. It's because the fate curvature gets messed up because there's no face here to contribute to these vertices. If we do something like, say, solidify it, and then put some bevel on that edge, it can get rid of that problem. We've got some more edge loops there created by the bevel, and subsurf, and now if we look at it, that problem has gone away because now there's another edge for it to curve around and to contribute to that curvature. All right, we're on our last bullet point, but we've got one more common issue to talk about, which is why we can't just fix everything with existing normal editing or with baking things to normal laps. So we've got our transfer normals that has solved our problems. We can go ahead and apply the modifier and keep them, and we can hide that now because we've solved the problem, right? Well, and then we go to rig or to form something, and if we move even a single point, the whole thing breaks again. Because notice, those other vertex normals are wiggling because they're getting recalculated. 
Now, they're not wiggling that much. You'd think it would do a lot more. And the reason for that is that the custom normal is still doing something. And this is because the custom normal and also normals you might make to a tangent normal map are saving an offset between the real normals. They're not overriding everything completely, otherwise nothing would change, but they also are still going to be influenced by any changes to the base mesh. The reasons for this are fairly straightforward, and it's only really confusing because of the domain we're operating in. When you think of a normal map, normally what they use for is to add a surface detail to a mesh. So you'll have a face that gets more detail on it, so of course that detail should move with that face, no problem. But in the case of what we're doing here, we're using the normal map or the custom normals to remove detail. So I've made this little example to show conceptually what the problem is. So let's say that this shape on the right, this curve, is our flawed mesh. This could even be a character's face seen from the side. And this one is the shape we want to have. When we use a tangent normal map or custom normals, we're saving the difference between the base shape and the desired shape, which in this case I've represented with these little arrows. That's how much this needs to, to change to be like this. So if we then deform the base, it's always adding the same amount on top. So it was the proper shape undeformed, but as soon as we start deforming, it's always going to still be wrong. It may be cleaner than the base shape, but it's never going to fully solve the problem. The goal is to get to the clean, proper shape, not to just add the same amount to the base shape in all circumstances. So what we need is this. As we deform the base, it's just recalculating how much of a difference that is to get to the desired shape. So this is what the normal transfer setup that we're going to be learning does. Since we keep the normal transfer live and also deform the desired shape to remain the desired shape, then things keep working even through deformations. The downside, of course, is that we have to add details back in some other way because the normal transfer will get rid of small details. But we probably wanted to do that for artistic control reasons anyway. Here's a look at the problem on the actual head model. On the left, the normals are all baked to a tangent normal map that uses the base mesh. And on the right, we have live normal transfer. So as we open the mouth, we can already see things are going crazy over here. And that's because some of these small faces that make up the lips are changing direction enough to screw up the normal map. Whereas on here, it's just getting overwritten by the normal transfer. We can also see it pretty easily on the eye sockets. And Subsurf doesn't help with this either. I, yeah, it really can't handle it there. Normal transfer isn't the only way to fix this problem. You just have to have some source of the clean shape. You can actually do a tangent map on top of the normal transferred mesh, which is part of the point of having all of our custom normal nodes that we'll get into. But you could also be using the generated face normals to get that clean shape. The point is that you somehow have to get to a clean shape that overrides the base mesh. Otherwise, you can't properly remove detail. All right, we've made it to the end of this series overview. We've now overviewed what we're going to be learning and the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, I guess this has been pretty long. Not all the videos in this series will end up being this long, but several of them will. I'm going to try to put one out about once a week, but considering that some of them will be very difficult to make, don't hold me too closely to that. In the meantime, please like and subscribe, and follow me on Twitter if you want to see updates and other experiments, or check out my huge thread of experiments leading up to this. There'll be a link in the description. And of course, you can also support me on Patreon if you like this content. It takes a huge amount of time to figure this stuff out, and then also to produce the videos about it, so any support is very appreciated. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.